Happy Easter. Thanks for joining online and connecting. Today we celebrate that Jesus is risen. And Easter isn't just about what happened 2,000 years ago. It's also about what can happen in your life today. Because Jesus changes everything. And the resurrection of Jesus is central to that promise. The first followers of Jesus, when they showed up on that first Easter morning, were showing up in a place of grieving, of loss. They believed Jesus was still dead. They were without hope, confused, doubting, isolated, hiding and fearful. They had seen Jesus bring change everywhere he went. They knew that Jesus brought change, that Jesus changed everything. He changed water into wine at his first public miracle, and they saw that. He changed the weather by calming storms, and they were in the boat with him when it happened. He changed the physical condition of people by healing them where the blind who couldn't see suddenly had sight. People that were deaf could hear. People that were lame could walk. He brought physical change to people. They saw that Jesus changed everything. He changed a kid's sack lunch into a catering order that could feed over 5,000 people. Jesus changes everything. He changed the way they saw themselves. He changed the way they saw others. He changed their identities. He changed the way they saw God. He changed the idea that the fact that they were in their sin, he changed the fact that they were forgiven. He changed that for them. He changed everything. He even, they'd even seen him change death to life in the life of a guy named Lazarus and in a couple of kids and maybe even others. But in their mind, Jesus was dead. It's lost on us because we know the rest of the story. We show up on Easter and when we hear Jesus rose from the dead, it doesn't surprise us. They were shocked. They weren't expecting it. And when Easter morning started, they knew that Jesus changed everything. But I think they, they, they kind of thought it was done. They started, then they started showing up at the tomb. If you have a Bible, turn to John chapter 20. And we read about what happened on that morning. The Gospel of John is written by one of Jesus' disciples. and It's written from his point of view. And he was there. But he even kind of admits to himself, uh, or to us, about himself that he was a mess. And he showed up that day not believing. And in John chapter 20, when we read this together, think about who was there. Also think about who wasn't there. Think about the people that were there, what they saw, what they experienced, what they felt. And think about this. One of the most convincing things for me in my faith is how after that Easter Sunday morning, everything changed for the people. They, their, their character changed, their, their attitudes changed, their lives were changed based on what they experienced that Easter morning. They saw and they were changed. John chapter 20, verse 1, it says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, very early in the morning, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. And she doesn't say, yes, Jesus is alive. She thinks somebody stole the body. Somebody desecrated his grave. She panics. She's sad. And she goes to tell the other disciples that they stole the body. She is rattled. And when that Easter morning started, even finding the tomb empty, she's sad. She's confused. Think about the others. There were other women that she ended up going to get and bringing with her. One of them, it looks like, might have been Mary, the mother of Jesus. She was at the cross when Jesus died. And her probably best thought that Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning, was somebody stole my son's body. There was other disciples, all hidden in houses, hiding, sad, giving up hope running away, locked up and hiding. We're told that Thomas was doubting. Peter and John, it looks like, started to go back to fishing, perhaps. They were wondering, what's now? What do we do now? Then you've got uh, John. He calls himself in the Gospel of John. He's the one that wrote the Gospel of John. He calls himself, never by name, he either calls himself the other disciple or the disciple that Jesus loved. He gave himself that nickname. 
He and his brother James were nicknamed the Sons of Thunder. They were prone to, out, uh, prone to outbursts of selfishness and anger. And although John was scared, he was actually there at the cross, and he was one of the only disciples that, with his own eyes, saw Jesus die on the cross. When others ran, he stayed. But he'd still given up hope. That Easter Sunday morning, not much had changed for him. He was thinking, this is the end. Peter is also locked away in hiding. And his last, strongest memory of Jesus is telling him, I will not deny you. And then shortly after that, he denied Jesus three times. And he's thinking of himself as a failure. He's thinking it, it's all over. There's lots of emotion that Easter Sunday morning when it started. Sadness, fear, confusion, doubt, guilt, failure, defeat, helplessness, hopelessness, isolation, hiding, uncertainty. They thought it was all over. And when she, Mary Magdalene found the empty tomb, she didn't think anything had changed. She's confused and she goes back to tell others. Verse 2, it says, So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, that's John, the one Jesus loved, that's the nickname he gave himself, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. They still don't think he's risen from the dead, even when they see the empty tomb. So she tells Peter and John, and then this is what happens next. Now, count along with me at home. Here's a little something to do at home. In, these next, in this next passage, count how many times John tells you in his gospel that he outran Peter to the tomb, right? John's a mess. Listen to this. Verse 3, so Peter and the other disciple, that's John, started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Verse 6, Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside and saw and believed. Four or five times there, John is telling you, hey, Easter morning, I outran Peter the tomb. I'm faster. John's a mess. And that's what I love about the Bible, is these guys are pretty honest. They were insecure. They were doubters. They were failures. They were scared. But something changed in them when they didn't just see the empty tomb, but when they saw the risen Jesus. That changed everything. Verse 9, it says, though this, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. See, there are these promises from hundreds, even several thousand years ago, that the, the Messiah would be raised, raised from the dead. Jesus had told them, I am going to be crucified. I am going to lay down my life, but on the third day, I will be raised again. He told them. And they even see the empty tomb, but they're not believing it. They didn't believe the promises. It says, then the disciples went back to where they were staying. They saw the empty tomb and thought, what do we do now? Someone stole his body. They don't know. Jesus had told them. He'd made promises. But at this point, I wonder if they thought they were just empty promises. I wonder if now they were doubting everything he'd ever taught. I wonder if now they were doubting what he had claimed he was going to do. They were all hiding. Nothing had changed yet. And the thing that we need to know is God keeps his promises. They're not empty promises. The, the, the scripture that we read, the promises that Jesus gives, the promises throughout the Bible, the things that we hold on to are not trite phrases or empty platitudes or, or just something to help us feel good and cheer us up. And when life gets really, really hard, when life is really, really uncertain, we start to doubt. And we think maybe these are just empty promises. 
or maybe they apply to somebody else and not to me, or maybe, maybe it's just not quite how I thought it was going to be. Whatever it is, these are not empty promises because the risen Jesus changes everything. And then Jesus shows up and he changes everything and he changes everyone. In verse 11, Mary's gone back to the tomb. She's standing outside. She stood outside the tomb crying. And at this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. She is aware of somebody walking behind her. So she turns around and Jesus is standing there, but she still doesn't recognize him. She still does not realize that it was Jesus. Let me just pause there. Sometimes in our life, Jesus has promised to be with us, and he is. He's at work around us, and he is. And that's going on, but we don't realize it. The risen Jesus was standing right in front of her. The tomb was empty. He was there, and she missed it until she heard him speak. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Let me ask you today on this Easter Sunday and or Saturday night, whichever service you're tuning in, this year, this time in your life, what are you looking for? Hope? Help? Direction? Forgiveness? God's provision? Like, what is it you're looking for? And can I just tell you this? What you're looking for is not found in a what. It's found in a who. It's found in the person of Jesus. What you were looking for in life is really who you need to be looking for. Jesus. The one who came looking for you. The one who showed up in a manger. Showed up on a cross. Showed up in a tomb, but he's not there anymore. And that changes everything. Mary Magdalene is weeping. She had already been impacted and changed by Jesus. Early in her life, she was spiritually out of control, possessed. And Jesus healed her and set her free and gave her a new identity. And she became one of the most courageous and committed followers of Jesus. And she's actually the first one at the tomb on Easter Sunday, the one that keeps going back and the one that Jesus has this first interaction with. And on that Easter morning, as she's weeping, everything changed for her. And for all the others. Because when you encounter Jesus, it changes everything. And when you encounter the risen Jesus, the reality of the resurrection, it changes everything. Jesus changes everything. For me, let me just tell you why I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. One of the great evidences of the resurrection is the evidence of who was there. The eyewitnesses. And not just they saw it firsthand, but also that it changed their lives. They went from failures and, and cowards and hiding and messes that brag about how fast they run to the tomb. I mean, all these things that are going on, like he changes them. They saw it and it changed them. That's why I believe in the reality of the resurrection. It changed them. And Jesus changes everything. Has he changed you? Mary Magdalene went from weeping to joy. And the Gospels reference her as a courageous follower of Jesus, brave enough to stand by Jesus in the hours of his suffering at the cross, when he dies, and beyond. She so shows up at the tomb. And think about this. Jesus, been, Jesus had been put to death. Followers of Jesus had scattered, but she's still saying, I'm with him and I'm going to his tomb, even though there are Roman guards that are there. She goes, I'm with Jesus. She was courageous. As a matter of fact, she was present at two of the most important moments, the crucifixion and the resurrection. And within all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, she is named at least 12 times more than most of the apostles. She was changed, and she was a courageous follower of Jesus. Then you have Mary, the mother of Jesus. How much had she had wept? The miracle of the birth of Jesus, where she was right there, Promises from angels, the miraculous of the wise men and all these things showing up and all the confirmation that Jesus is the Son of God and he was was entrusted to her. She was there at the manger. She was there through his whole life and she was there at the cross and thought, it's all over. And her weeping, her sadness is turned to joy and celebration. 
the disciples who ran like cowards, scattered, locked in rooms, afraid, go from hiding and shameful to hopeful, ultimately going to the world, ultimately uh, uh, 10 out of the 11 being put to death because of their faith. Who would die for a lie? They saw it, they believed it so much that under torture, they were willing to say, Jesus rose from the dead. He changed my life. I'll gladly give my life for him. It changed them. Peter and John, these two central disciples in the middle of it, and Thomas, Thomas was a doubter. He goes to believing. He also was put to death. Peter, put to death. He goes from being a failure to Jesus a few days later, restoring him and say, Peter, you're not, you're, you're not about your past. Your past doesn't define you. I do. And he sets Peter free to make a difference in the world. And Peter, who goes from being a failure, stands up for Jesus, willingly gives his life for Jesus. It changed him. John is the only disciple that didn't get put to death through torture and crucifixion or persecution or execution. He lived to be an old age, but they tried to kill him, actually. They tried to boil him in... In, in hot oil, and he lived through it miraculously, so they put him in exile on an island where he wrote the, gospel, uh, the, the, the book of Revelation, the prophetic book of Revelation. He lived a long life. And he suffered greatly in his life. And he was willing to do that because he saw the risen Jesus, and it changed him to the core of who he was. It changed his identity. It changed his life. It changed everything. And he said, I'm gladly willing to give my life to Jesus who gave his life for me and gives his life to me. John gave himself that nickname, the one Jesus loved. It almost feels a little bit like the I'm faster than Peter running to the tomb kind of thing, kind of a braggy thing. I don't think that's what it was. I think John struggled with knowing that God loved him. But at the end of the day, when he saw how Jesus lived, And when he saw how Jesus died, and when he saw what Jesus entrusted to him by saying, I want you to go to the world and tell people about me, when he encountered the risen Jesus, he knew that God's promise, that for God so loved the world, that for God so loved John, that he gave his one and only son. I think when he experienced the risen Jesus, he believed what God promised is true. God loves me. I'm the disciple Jesus loves. I'm not the only one, but I know I'm the disciple that Jesus loves. It became his identity. It changed him. See, Jesus changes everything. He changes our past. That's what the cross is all about, that he pays the penalty for our sin, that I have messed up in life, and I am sinful. I am selfish. I agree with Jesus and say, I'm a mess. And God, who is perfect, sent his perfect son to make the perfect sacrifice and pay the penalty for my sin on the cross, the the perfect for the imperfect. The cross changes our past. Jesus changes, changes everything. You're not about what you have done. You are about what Jesus has done for you. It changes our past. We have a new identity. We're a new creation. We are forgiven and free. He changes our past. He changes our present. He makes this promise that I will be with you always. I am with you and I will be with you is the most frequently given promise throughout all of Scripture. That's God's desire to be with you always. That's His promise. That's what He wants for you. And it's made possible because of the cross. It changes our future. It changes our past, present, and future. Our future is different. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. So in this life, when you die, there's more to this life than meets the eye. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Your future, your eternity is secure because of what Jesus has done for you. His promises impact our past, our present, our future. Jesus changes everything. He's changed people I know. I had a guy in my small group. His name is Don. Don would come to my Friday morning men's group faithfully, and he loved it. He loved reading scripture and and reflecting on the promises of God and applying it to our life. He loved it. 
Don had cancer, and it got quite serious, and he knew it. And he would talk about how his faith helped him navigate this, how the reality of who Jesus is and the promises of God helped him navigate and steer through the uncertainty of cancer and ultimately the certainty of an impending death. And I'll never forget one day when Don walked into church. I said, Don, how are you? He said, well, Doc gave me some bad news. And uh, he said, the cancer is growing. And I said, I I'm so sorry, Don. And I'll never forget what he said next. He said, Doug, I I'm not worried. My faith is growing faster than my cancer. Jesus changes everything. That we can face the darkest hours in this world with our faith holding on to the promises of God that we can count on because of an empty tomb. Because Jesus has taken care of our past, I don't need to fear death. Because he's taking care of my present and he's with me, I don't have to fear whatever I'm facing. I don't have to fear death in my future because he, Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you and I'm with you every step of the way until you get there. I love what he said. My faith is growing faster than my cancer. I hope right now in this season of life that my faith is growing faster than my fear. See, I, I'm somebody else that I, I, it's changed me. I'm a mess. A lot of people will tell you that, but I'll be the first to admit it. I'm a mess. I'm selfish. I worry a lot. I'm shy. I'm introverted. And when I encountered Jesus and the reality, the fact that Jesus changed my past, he's with me now in my present. And he's prepared something for my future. And I recognize that the risen Jesus has made promises to me and I entered into a relationship with him, and I, I believed in Jesus. Not I see it for a long time. I believed in Jesus the same way I believed in George Washington. It was a historical person. I believed he really existed. But, but it was like believing in George Washington, except George Washington was about history, and Jesus was about religion. But, but then when I realized that Jesus historically really lived, really died, really rose again, that he really loves me, he really forgives me, he really wants to live his life in me and through me, and he has plans for me. It changed me. And yeah, I'm still a mess. I'm still selfish. I still worry a lot. I'm pretty shy. I'm pretty reluctant sometimes to, to step into things relationally. But I can see how he's changing me. That his promise that, that he will finish what he started in me and that he, each day he's working in me to build a big faith and move my life forward in his story. It's changed me. It's changed this, taking this shy, selfish, worried guy, and he's asked him to be a leader and influence others. Only God could do that. That's not me. Jesus changes everything. Has he changed you? If you've given your life to Jesus, he'll change you. And if he hasn't, have you really given your life to Jesus or do you just believe in him the way you believe like I did as George Washington or he's just kind of an add-on to your life instead of being the Lord and Savior of your life, the forgiver and leader of your life? It'll change you. It changed the Apostle Paul. He wasn't there at the empty tomb. And later on, he was actually trying to put in jail and kill the ones that were. He hated the followers of Jesus. And he thought he was doing the right thing, but he wanted to stop this Jesus movement. And then one day, Jesus got a hold of his life and it changed him completely. And this is what he wrote as the most important thing you need to know. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and following, it says, For what I received, he wasn't there, it was told to him. What I received, I passed on to you as first importance. This is what matters most that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. See, here's the core of what he says is first importance. 
He says this, Jesus died, he was buried, he was raised to life, and he appeared. He died. Jesus really did die on a cross, and that changes everything. He was buried. He was put in a tomb. But none of that matters, because that's true for everybody. Everyone dies and gets buried. What's different, died, buried, and raised to life. That changes everything. And he appeared, and it changed the life of everybody he appeared to. Suddenly, everything changes. And he, Paul says, this is first importance. This matters more than anything. It's first importance. Why is this what matters most? Here's why. Here's why this is first importance. Why it makes a difference to you. He goes on to say this in verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. If Jesus wasn't raised from the dead 2,000 years ago, I, I need to give up what I'm doing for a living, and you need to give up who you're believing in for your life. Our faith in Jesus doesn't matter. He's just another guy that had good stuff to say, was a good leader, a good man. None of it matters. He goes on to say in 17, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. It doesn't matter. It doesn't work. It's just empty platitudes or positive sayings or positive thinking. And you're still in your sins. That sin problem of us being a mess and trying to get into a relationship with a perfect God, it's still a problem. And those who have fallen asleep, those who have died in Christ, are lost. When we stood by their graves and believed that they've gone, they're in a better place, that God prepared a place for them, none of that matters. None of it's true if Jesus has not been raised for this life, uh, to new life. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, if it's only something to help us navigate our days until our days are done, we are of all people most to be pitied. Feel sorry for me if Jesus isn't raised from the dead. Make fun of me if Jesus isn't raised from the dead. It doesn't matter to me if Jesus isn't raised from the dead. If Jesus, is, Jesus isn't alive, if the tomb is not empty, none of it matters. None of what he taught, none of what he claimed to be, none of our faith, none of it. But if he is, if he is risen from the dead, if he is alive, if the tomb is empty, all of it matters. Every single piece of it. Everything he claimed to be, everything he taught, everything about our faith in him, every promise he's given us is true. It matters. All of it matters. If Jesus rose from the dead. And that was what Paul came to believe. He said this, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Everything matters. Everything changes. Jesus changes everything. And these promises that Jesus taught, these promises throughout the Bible that we cling to and look to, especially in days like this where we're worried and fearful and in need, but every day of our life, there are promises of God that we believe and we cling to. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, these are just empty promises. They have nothing for us. But... If the tomb is empty, then the promises of God are not empty promises. It matters. All of it. It counts. All of it. Everything changes. I can trust in His promises. I can trust in Him because the tomb is empty. And that, because of that, these are not empty promises. So let me ask you this. What are the promises of God that you are counting on right now? Whatever they are, here's what I want to do. I want to give you a challenge. Some of you have been doing it this week leading up to Easter. Keep doing it today. Keep doing it this week. We've been asking you to use the hashtag L-O-C-C God promises and share promises on social media that you're counting on. Like one of them that I count on is, is uh, 1 Peter 5 um, tells us that he says, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. I have a lot of worries. But because of that promise that Peter, the one of his disciples, told us that he did as a leader, he said, I cast my cares 
upon Jesus because he cares for me and he can carry my burdens. I'm counting that promise to be true. I'm counting on the promise that Jesus says, Matthew 28, 20, I will be with you always. I'm counting on it. So here's what I want you to do. Share those with each other. Share them on Facebook. Share them on Instagram. Share them in text. Share them in conversations. Let's keep sharing these promises of God because if the tomb is empty, these are not empty promises. We can believe it, all of it. Because the empty tomb changes everything. If the tomb is empty, then the promises of God are not empty promises. So what I want to challenge you to do is make a list. Write down on paper. Maybe get a journal and start writing down. These are the promises of, promises of God that I cling to and look to. And every time you read one, remind me. Remind yourself. As I remind myself, the tomb is empty. So this is not an empty promise. God keeps his promises. I can trust it. Make a list of the promises and then share them. And again, we encourage you to use that hashtag, L-O-C-C, God Promises, and then maybe use that to search through promises that others have shared. Like on them, comment them, share them with others. Let's make sure we're constantly talking about these things that are true, these promises of God that are not empty promises because the tomb is empty. Here's the promises of God that I can't count on. Romans 8.32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? If Jesus showed up on the cross, if he kept that promise, that was the toughest promise to keep. It cost him the most. If he fulfilled that promise, he says, how will God also not, along with that, graciously give us all things? I have everything I need. God's going to give me everything I need. Because he gave me the thing I needed most at the cross. He gave you Jesus. So you can count on the rest of the promises. You can count on God giving you the rest of what you need in life. But let me ask you this. Have you taken God up on that first promise that he kept of showing up at the cross, of giving his life for you? That's where it all starts. Have you given your life to Jesus, the one who gave his life for you so he could give his life to you? Have you received him? Have you accepted it? Have you exchanged your life for his? I want to give you a moment to do that right now. If you've never had a day in your life, in your history, there was a real uh, time, a day in history, where Jesus died on a cross. There was a real day in history, on a calendar, where Jesus rose from the dead. Was there a day in history, on a calendar, a moment in time where you gave your life to Jesus? If not, how about it's this moment right now? John 1.12 says this, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. When you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and he did what he said he did, when you receive that as a gift into your life, it's actually like a gift exchange. I give my life to him, my life is yours. And he says the same thing. I gave my life for you, and I want to give my life to you. There's an exchange. When you believe and receive, you become a child of God. If you've never done that, I want to give you a chance to do that right now. And if you have done that before, I encourage you just to say a prayer of thanksgiving, saying, God, thanks that there was a moment in history where you died for me. Thanks there wasn't a moment in history where I gave my life to you. But if you've never done that, let me pray with you right now and give you a chance to receive that into your life. You could pray something like this. Dear Jesus, thank you for showing up on the cross for me. I'm a mess. I'm a sinner. I know I need you. I know I need what only you can give. Forgiveness. New life. I believe that you are who you say you are. I believe that you did what you say you did. I believe that because of you and in you, I am who you say I am. I give my life to you, the one who gave his life for me. And I ask you to give your life to me. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your 
life into me. I receive your leadership of my life. And I will say to you, Jesus, I will follow you. And my life now belongs to you. God, thank you for the cross and the empty tomb and how it can change me. I believe it. I receive it and believe that I have just become a child of God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that for the first time, I want to ask you to do something. There's a link that will show up either in the feed of what you're watching on, depending on what platform, um, or there's a button you can click if you're watching the church online platform. But if you would just let us know that you made that decision today. We have some resources we would like to send you. If you're still thinking about it, please reach out to us. There's a way you can do that where you can tell us, I still have questions. If you made that decision, you said, I gave my life to Jesus for the first time, you can let us know that. We'll send you some resources. If you decided today, you know what, I'm just recommitting my life. I met, there was a point in my history where I did that, but I've not lived as a follower of Jesus for a while. I want to recommit my life to him. You can do that too. But please fill out this link and let us know that you decided to follow Jesus today. We would love to know that. In the Facebook comments, on the box on the web stream, let us know. Or you can go to the Live Oak website, live-oak.org, slash Easter Next Steps. And actually, that live-oak.org slash Easter Next Steps has a lot of links for you. Even if you've already done that before, if you were already a follower of Jesus, and you just said, God, I'm, I'm thankful for what you did for me. I'm already a follower of Jesus. There's actually some next steps for you. For anybody today, we have a reading plan that for the next 10 days, we can focus on the hope we have in the promises of God because of Jesus. It's a reading plan by Max Lucado that's in the uh, Version Bible app. And if you'll fill out, fill out the link at live-oak.org slash easternextsteps, you can let us know that you're interested in being included in a reading plan where you'll be with others and you can read uh, at your own pace uh, a devotional. There's even a video to watch, some scripture each day. And then you can comment within this group to encourage each other. You can also, again, let us know that you want to be part of that plan. Anybody could do that. The other next step I want to ask you to make is to keep sharing your promises. What are the promises you count on? That you can, you can count on because the tomb is empty. You know these are not empty promises. Share those on Facebook, Instagram, and text. Because of Jesus, it changes everything. I hope it's changed you. I hope that you'll live today and tomorrow and the next day and the next and the next with the reality that Jesus changed everything, including you. And we live in a new world because of the resurrection. We live as children of God that count on the promises of God that are now used by God to impact others. I'm thankful that Jesus changes everything. I'm thankful that Jesus changes me because there's a lot about me he needed to change. And he still needs to change. And he promises that he will finish what he started, that he who began a good work in you, he'll be faithful to complete it. He showed up at the cross. That was the toughest promise to keep. He'll keep all the rest.